Well, welcome, welcome to this. Um, I've never done a webinar before. I'm, I'm more used to giving a lecture and then about 10 minutes into it, getting bored stiff listening to myself and then going to attack somebody in the audience. Well, I can't do that today. It's very frustrating. Um, Gary had asked me to give a talk. I think it was Stephen Voutridge's fault in the first place. And uh, I, I, I sent him a batch of talks that I'd given recently to see which one most fitted the bill. And something like this, do water beetles live in water? A stupid question. That seemed to be near enough. So, but then as I started to prepare this um, talk, um, I found that I, I actually knew a bit more about Northwest England than I thought. And so the, the talk ended up as, do what water beetles live in Northwest England? How many are there? What habitats do they live in? Uh, what, what are the rare ones? And is there any way of brightening up your day using them? So here we go. Um, I've got to acknowledge images. So notice even there, Holiday Cottages Cumbria, I was quite pleased with. Um, Will Watson's in there, thank goodness, and there he's turned up. Um, I did, did use some of your slides. Uh, Leanne, obviously, for setting the thing up. Gary, for taking the blame. Uh, what about recording? Uh, oops, this, this is worrying because it's hanging. I hope it's not hanging too long. No, here we go. Um, I, 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 my scheme, for what it's worth, is uh, 344 species. So it's a lot more than most recording schemes. Uh, but that doesn't, it doesn't really end there because in addition to my recording scheme for water beetles, uh, Michael Geyser looks after leaf beetles and that includes quite a few beetles that are confined to water. Uh, there's also Adrian Fowles has got a weevil recording scheme and that, that includes some very important species of aquatic weevils that Gary will talk about later on this evening. Um, then on top of that, John T. Denton, who's, who's a local product, I think originally from Carlisle, down south, but he, he works on uh, these goggle-eyed um, staffs that you see zooming around on water surfaces sometimes, Stennis. So he looks after them. And if you start having all these in, you're, before you know it, you've got 450 species. And then, in fact, you've probably got more like 600 species of beetle in Britain, which are utterly dependent on uh, moisture and water. And we've got about half a million records of them. Uh, as far as the scheme is concerned, 235 of those 344 species live in wetlands that have vegetation. Then there's uh, 28 that live in water without any vegetation, 38 that live in running water, which may or may not have vegetation, some in salt water, some in deeply shaded habitats, uh, where in fact the actual type of shade doesn't seem to matter in many cases. It, it could just be the culvert or a bridge. It doesn't have to actually be a tree, but dead leaves do play a part. Then on top of that, you've got species which are entirely subterranean. And just for our sins, we, we also get lumbered with some of the dung beetles, which just some of them happen to be um, members of the, the hydrophility, which is mainly a water group, beetle group. And uh, so 19 species, mainly living in dung, sometimes in other sorts of wet refuse, are also covered by the recording scheme, simply because nobody else will look after them. The, the, the dung beetle recording scheme covers mainly... Uh, uh, Gaia troopies and Aethrodus. And that brings me on to another subject, which is pronunciation. Uh, I don't care how you pronounce what you say, and I don't care how I pronounce it. I, I, I'm, I'm, if I'm, I might say Gaia troopies one day and Gia troopies the next. It doesn't matter, as long as you roughly identify what I'm saying, it's fine. So don't worry about pronunciation. Uh, yeah, let's go back in time. In 1970s, I, I started to work with Margaret Palmer in the Brex in Norfolk. And we came up, or she came up rather, I should say, with, with a very, straight, very straightforward relationship between the numbers of flowering plants you find in a pond and the numbers of water beetles and bugs that you find in a pond. In other words, the, the richer the macrophytes, the richer the bee beetle, in, beetle species, to the point where you might say, Sorry, well, why bother to look at beetles anyway? Just, uh, just go and count the plants. You've still got, you've got a good way of fixing on what's a good site and what's a bad site. Um, that was in 1981, she published that. But then more recently, Alan Law in the University of Dundee and colleagues, and I, I got wrapped in, tied into this as well. He did more or less the same thing only as, on a sort of modern clever basis. Um, and he used three huge databases he acquired, uh, one of the Lake District, <coughs> and another one for um, uh, Norfolk, and another one for the surrounds of Glasgow. And uh, I'll, tell, I'll, give you, I'll give you a tip, by the way, in, in the Lake District, he found a wonderful way. I said, how on earth are you going to do all this survey work in the middle of summer in the Lake District? No way. 
uh, I, you, you can't get anywhere. They said, it's easy. they said it was easy. I just hire a white van and I park it anywhere I like and nobody bothers me. And it, so, so, so I think that's the uh, best advice I can probably give you this evening. Just hire a white van. Um, Anyway, they did all this, this, this survey work in uh, parking in some very awkward places in the Lake District in Kettleway of Murder. And he came up with this straightforward relationship, although it may not look straightforward to you at the moment, which is that the more plants there are, lo and behold, the more mollusks there are, the more dram damselflies, dragonflies there are, and the more beetles there are. So, oh, so yes, OK, so it's the same old stuff, only uh, sort of dressed up in modern parlance. Beetles, the R square there, that's not the same as the R you get on the news every day. Uh, it, it, the significance factor is not as good for beetles as, as the other ones. And there's a good reason for that, because beetles are much more interesting than uh, mollusks and dragon damselflies and dragonflies. Anyway, so I, got, I, I put my name on this, I was, because I, I did load mostly identifications. Um, I got involved in this um, paper on, uh, on, on, the, on the Hydroscape project, as it was called. But I'm much more interested in what happens on outside that box. That, the box is just the relationship between plants and beetles. Outside the box, you've got lots of running water problems, shade, shade beetles, subterranean beetles. You've got the deep lakes, which often don't have no vegetation, or if they do, it doesn't matter too much. You've got brand new habitats, which may not even have time to grow any plants by the time the beetles get there. Uh, you've got salt water, which often has just no more than a mat of algae. And you've also got, as I said, we're, we're lumbered with these dung species. So it's a whole series of beetles that live outside that, that straightforward box of um, ponds and, and plants. Um, just backtracking a bit, we, we, we run training courses now and again, not, not recently, it has to be said. Uh, I think one of the first in the northwest of England was in Shropshire, which I know is not quite northwest, they have to do. Uh, and there we got 42 species in one morning with about seven people working on, on a site. And that was, that was actually more than enough to keep us going for two days. The disaster struck when we then uh, started to run courses with the Freshwater Biological Association in, in, uh, in, on, on Windermere. And we went to Tarn House here and I managed struggling to get 12 species during the day, which you know, I, I was very pleased when I, I managed to bring with me a whole stack of dead species for people to look at. I didn't, I didn't really like to do that. I thought it's much better if people collect their own material and identify it and sort it out on the sales. Anyway, that, 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 was, well, that was one problem, but we averted this problem by going, finding another place in 2011 to 2014. Um, consistently, uh, as different, different groups of students, we got 34 to 36 species in these ponds. Um, that, that proves two things, with well, the main one being that we didn't destroy the site in 2011. We did actually leave something, there was something left over for the following years. But also, that was a just about right, 30 odd species in a very good pond. It, it, no, sorry, sorry, I should say, a good pond should give you more than 30 species. Um, these, this, this mixture of sites on under Millbeck Common was ideal for training because um, you've got a good range of species and it was enough to keep people happy for two days. Um, you just about, by the end, by about four o'clock on the second day, people had actually twigged what everything was. Anyway, Northwest England. Um, we use Watsonian Vice Counties, which are VC7, Cumberland. We don't talk about Cumbria. Um, we have VC69, which is Westmoreland, and then we have three bits of Lancashire, northwest and south, and then, of course, Cheshire. Um, they're, they're the main chunks of northwest England, plus bits and pieces. And what's happened as a result of trying to do this talk is I sort of realised, hang on, hang on a minute, this, this area has or had the five various water beetles in Britain. Now, that, 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 you can challenge that if you like later on, but... Uh, I'll, I'll start on that premise that we're looking at a surprisingly large number of rare species uh, found in northwest England and, and nowhere else. If you take this, this is a shot of some of you, I hope you can recognise, this is Windermere looking south. Um, big area, uh, going rapidly into deep water, no vegetation, wave washed shore. And on, on this shore you will find this beetle, three and a half millimetres long, yellow, black stripes, nebriporus depressus. Um, if you were able to extract all those beetles from that site, um, you would probably find that was the commonest beetle in the whole of northern Britain, uh, living in just that one site. So it's actually very common there, but it nevertheless has an endangered status um, because it is, it is rare on a national basis. And it lives in deep water and it doesn't, it's not really bothered about whether there's any vegetation or not. 
Um, here's its distribution. Now, I hope you can see these maps. I'm not sure whether I've blown them up enough for you, but uh, basically the, the black triangle is a millennial. The black dots, the black circles are 1980s to 2000. And then the gray ones are anything before that. And now and again, you'll see a, a fossil, which is an X. So, so look, look for the more black it is, the better it is. And you can see the distribution of this. Is, this is rather peculiar. It's, it's common in Ireland. It's fairly frequent in, in, the, in northern Scotland, up into the Orkneys even. Um, there's one or two sites for in, in where I live, down in, down in this area here, uh, in the southern uplands, Loch Doon in particular. It's, it's almost as common as it is in Lake Windermere. And then you see it in some of the bigger lakes in the Lake District. And there's a, there's a very dodgy record, which is disputed for one site in Wales. So there we have a distribution where the, uh, this, this rare beetle is on the very edge of its distribution. On the fact on the, well, actually on the eastern edge almost, but certainly on the northern edge, uh, the southern edge as far as Britain is concerned, but also very common in Ireland. Um, presume that some of you at least know what's going on here, which is that this has a sister species, Nebriopurus elegans, and to, that, that requires a talk in its own right to get that sorted out. This species, basically, they can interbreed. The elegans, the, the other species, is, is much more common and presumably more in some ways aggressive and survives better than depressors, which is now sort of slowly appears, appears to be retreating into the north. So that's one distribution. Now hang on to that map there. Right, now let's go on to the other species lives, in the, lives or lived in the same place. This is Windermere again. This is the same area. Uh, this species, Stenelmus canaliculator, was found here new to Britain in 1960. It lives in very deep water in, in Germany, it can live down, it's been found to live, I think, as deep as nine metres. Uh, it, it's got a, a plastron, which is a, a sort of air, air covering, uh, with, with, uh, which allows it to actually breathe underwater without coming to the surface to renew its air su supply. Um, it tends to live under flat rocks in well oxygenated water. Though. And uh, it last was seen in winter in 1978. We have looked for it a bit. But I don't think we've really put our heart and soul in so actually looking through it properly. I think it could be still there, especially if you see its distribution map. Because you look at this, is, this is the, almost the, the flip of the other species I was talking about that was in Windermere. There you've got that one grey dot in Windermere. And nowadays it's, it's frequent in the, in the Thames, it's in the Y, it's in the Severn. You see this skein of old fossil records in the Midlands, a few, few, few sites in southwest England as well. Uh, and this is a species that again is on the, on the edge of its distribution in winter, but the other, the other edge. Um, so that's, 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 the, that's the phenomenon we're talking about, the fact that you can have species on the north, northern edge and species on the southern edge. Here are some ordinary puddles. If you could um, go out tomorrow, if the weather's reasonable, and you went around Eccleston or Hullerton, is it Hullerton? Somebody connect my, can correct my pronunciation in the Lake District, Hullish, where they look a bit further south. You could find plenty of grassy puddles like this anywhere at uh, this time of year in Britain. And you'd get, say, eight species. And uh, you could start collecting beetles now without being worried about being overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of species. So that the, you could do that at this time of year. If you wanted to be more clever, you would go for a grassy puddle and add some moss in it. Uh, here's a classic example. This is a pond at Ings. If you're looking out of the railway, uh, railway train from um, Oxenholm down to, to Windermere, you'd see this. Sometimes you'd see us as well collecting beetles in it. This is a pond that has a pile of old uh, marley uh, concrete rubble, rubble dumped in it at one end. And it's covered in moss. And this beetle, which we're going to talk about for some time, is called the Oxbow Diving Beetle. Incredibly stupid name I conjured up for it, which we're stuck with. Uh, Hydrophus rufifrons makes more sense. And uh, this species loves to live in very, very shallow, moss, very shallow water amongst moss with a bit of um, sedges and junkers and so on. Uh, they're, not, they're not all as brightly coloured as this. That, that's, that's a particular variety. Uh, yeah, if you go here, uh, one of the sites, I've never actually found it here yet. This is above wise. How do you pronounce, has anyone else, how do you pronounce Wyzine Tarn? I, that, that's what I call it anyway. Wyzine Tarn in Lake District. Uh, often when I go there, the, the pond is dry. And that's the point. 
the, these, these, these ponds that the, these species live in are often bone dry throughout most of the summer and into the autumn. Uh, because these beetles act, like it that way, and it actually makes sure there are no fish, which are predators, and also gets rid of quite a few other competing animals as well. And these beetles are perfectly capable of surviving for several months on end without, without the need for water, uh, just going in comatose. But it, it occurs in that area, um, and another picture over here again. And this is another site for it. It looks the same as the first site I showed you, which is a very shallow edge of a mossy pond. But this, in fact, is, is a, a, a Winster Wetlands SSSI, uh, of, I think, Bowness in, in the Lake District, uh, on, by Cat Crag. And uh, this is actually a big floating carpet, quite quite dangerous place to get into in parts. There's some snow there as well. I hope you get the message now. I hope you notice most of these sites, it looks it's a miserable day. Whenever we go out, it always seems to be raining. Uh, these are not the usual sorts of insects. Um, People may know this site. It, it is, I think, it's quite well known locally as, as being the medicinal leech pond at, at Staveley. Uh, and at some stages, this this big hydrophilus rufifrons can be absolutely abundant in this site. Now, other, other times, it's not there at all. Um, but th this is um, was originally found. The, the, it was just the, sorry, I get this right. The first record of hydrophilus rufifrons in this area was um, by Pascal and Nicolette working in the ponds, well, well, I think what they, what they call it now, the Freshwater Trust, Freshwater Habitats Trust, there we go. Um, this, is, this is my favourite site because I discovered it. This is near Sedberg, uh, or unless you pronounce it some other way. And it's what I would call a, a really good quality Tina Turner fen. Um, th this was only for the benefit of some of you old enough to remember Tina Turner. She's still around, I think. But uh, anyway, there you, are. you can see lots and lots of Tina Turner's dancing to the music there. And you can't see a, not a drop of water anywhere because what you've got is a little bit of moisture and moss underneath a, one of these tussocks. And that's where these beetles live uh, in this, this site. And it's, it's actually being actually abundant there. It's still there as of this year. But you can also get it in different sorts of places. These are little, little tarns on the fells in the, in the south of Lake District. And all you've got left here is a bit of wet grass, a bit of mud, a few strands of junkers, of rushes. And in this case, you can see that, that that's rather heath, or I think it's actually pronounced differently to that. I'm worried about these pronunciations. Russell and Pool, uh, the other point here is that this is that the pool, that's not the pool. The pool is actually a little stream valley. Uh, and this is one of the ponds in that valley. And the beetles are hanging on like grim death. You'd be lucky if you find one or two specimens during the whole day. And you see most of this junkus in this pond has been eaten by the Herdwick sheep, which are sitting in the background there. Um, they, so it's in these sites, but it's in, very, in great danger of these sites completely being destroyed, uh, losing all their moss and their tussocky structures. Uh, here is Stephen. Can you see yourself, Stephen? Yes, there you are. Yes. And there is Gary, our host. And there, this is the most important thing in this photograph, which is a GB net. Uh, named after Jill, Jill Baldwin, not after G, not of Great Britain. And he, so there's Gary sort of so doing his best to find the Hydrophilus rufifrons in this relatively new nature reserve in uh, by the Cumbria Wildlife Trust. This is Loic Moss. And uh, you can see it's rectangular, this pond. It's, 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 a, it's an unnatural pond dug out perhaps from an existing pond, or certainly near to some existing ponds anyway. And we, we found rufifrons in all these sites. Now, I worked this site, Gary worked this site, Stephen worked this site. And uh, when we'd finished working the site, uh, Sue came up, my wife, with a tea strainer, and she got one of these hydrophilus rufifrons straight away, whereas we failed to get it completely. Uh, it's just the point is that it lives in very shallow water, and if you just use a tea strainer, you don't necessarily need a GB net. Right. Here's the distribution we're talking about, this one. Now, we're starting to get a pattern here. In the, here we have a beetle that uh, is in the southern upland, south of the southern uplands. Uh, I live north of the southern uplands. I can't find it there, for example. It's only down there. Uh, the, the latest record within the last couple of months is in Wigtownshire, so it's still doing quite well along the, along the south edge of the southern uplands. It's in the south of the Lake District, doing well there. Uh, one site down there. Uh, it, it's doing well in, still in, uh, in Wales, around Tregaran Bog. But you'll see it's completely died out in the whole of its eastern range, uh, in the Cambridgeshire Fens and around London and 
in, into Yorkshire and even further north into North Northumberland. That site, we can't find it there now. Uh, and it's not doing very well in the Highlands either. There's some fairly well-known sites for it where you can't find it anymore. Um, so we, we staged an, an introduction, or well, the introduction. We took material from the Ings Pond, the first pond I showed you, and we took it to, um, to North Lincolnshire. And it was still there, not this year, I don't think anybody's checked this year, but it's certainly been there to last year. So it's, it's survived for well over 10 years in the same site, actually doing quite well. So we, we hope we've actually had a successful reintroduction there. Uh, we haven't, we tried the same thing in Norfolk and it didn't work. Um, one of the strangest things about this is that when we were doing this work, we found that just up the road from Ings is Staveley, in, in, again on that, on that road from the motorway down through to Windermere. And, uh, there was a chap there, Philip Blasdale was living there. He was, used to be a colleague of mine. Work, he used to work in Aberdeen. And he actually got, he was the last person to get this Hydropolis roof of bronze by, on his bicycle uh, in the 1940s. And so one of those grey dots is his grey dot. Anyway, he's passed on now. But strangely, he was actually living, ultimately spent the rest of the, the last of his days actually beside one of the best sites for it. All right, changing the subject, different species. This is Donacia aquatica, um, and in 2003, we decided to do a survey of all its known sites in Britain and Ireland, which was, we eventually succeeded, it's a bit ambitious. This, I called this thing the zircon reed beetle. I wanted to call it a, a rainbow beetle, but you can't, because it already had that name, another, another species had got that name. But, but nowadays, I suppose we could call this the NHS beetle. It's, um, it's got every colour of the rainbow and a few more besides. It's purple, green, blue, gold, silver. Wonderful thing. A Donatia aquatica. Very pretty. There's a delight to behold wherever you get it. My last record of it um, was two years ago in the Arctic in Sweden. Um, so it gets that far north. Anyway, this one, when I went to the, one of the well-known or the most recent recorded sites for it in the Lake District was at Newlands Beck. And I was disgusted to find when I get, got there that all the bed of carex or sedges that it would normally be found in had disappeared and been impounded. Um, so we, this is when we started to do the survey in early, trying to track down all the old records. Okay, you see, now you've got the same pattern here again, um, scattered around the Scotland, surviving in Central Island in this case, scattered around the Lake District, old records here and there. Dying out completely in the Midlands, uh, still I think in the north of Broads. I can't see that because we're all standing in the way in my, in my setup. Uh, so it's in the north of Broads and it's also one site in Sussex. But you see this pattern that's developing with these maps that um, the northwest of England suddenly becomes rather important. Uh, here's another picture of it again. And this is my, uh, I've been watching recently with admiration some of Will Watson's uh, photographs of um, Herefordshire. In fact, most of them are my screensavers now, Will, on, on all the computers. Um, but I think, I, I think you'd have to compete with this one. This is my favourite, my best ever photograph, which is Ray Myers Tarn in the Lake District. And there I found uh, Donatia aquatica abundant in the end in our server, uh, in, in this big bed of um, sedges along the, the, this edge here. Um, anyway, the record that's of interest, the Gary, I think, is prosecuting this one, is uh, at Tatton Park uh, in, in Cheshire. Uh, and it's at Malchit Mere. That Malchit Mere is actually very good for reed beetles anyway. There are lots of other species there, which is a bit worrying because it might just be that somebody's confused this with uh, Donatia vulgaris, which is not as beautiful as this one, but it's still quite, they've still got a bright colored species. They might've got muddled up. So we're, we're tracking down this, the original record of this species at Malchit Mere. But that would be one of what, an extreme outlying case for this beetle. Um, now changing subject again. Um, it's one of the, but, so I'm just I'm really showing you basically my favourite photographs. I think this is this is um, Mark Young's bathwater in, um, in the, when, when he discovered he was sitting in this bath and he found this beetle three and a half millimetres long, a very pretty beetle in my reckoning. You may think it looks exactly like the others, but it doesn't. Uh, he found this chugging around in the bath with him. In, in his house in Aberdeenshire. Uh, and uh, he was, so went up to his loft and there it was swimming around in the system. And he was pumping it up from underneath, the, uh, underneath his house. It's a subterranean species. Um, there's, there's even a record for a hotel in Glasgow in the same situation. Uh, and 
the most recent records that I've got for Northwest England are uh, for quite old, and they're for around uh, Ingleborough in, in uh, subterranean waters there. But a species that could turn up virtually anywhere uh, in, in, in subterranean waters that have been left under, undisturbed. Here, here are the most recent records I know of, which is um, in Dumfries, Dumfries and Chur. Is it, this is, if you walk up the hill to, to, of the Grey Mare's Tail, uh, you'll find springs coming out of the, of the sides of the cliff with a bright, livid, livid uh, yellow green mosses on them. And, and if you get the right, really, really miserable wet conditions, lots of hydraulic pumping action, this beetle will be pumped out onto the, onto the open surface just briefly until it has a, has a sense to get back down underground. Um, so water is good. Here's another example of water. Um, you'll see this is dated November. This is dated 21st of November 2017. So you could still be out collecting beetles at this time of year. And the miserable, it was an absolutely foul day going up to school, not time. Um, nothing around. Uh, could hardly see you in, in front of you because the glasses get covered in water. And uh, I could pick up one beetle, which was Rantus suturalis, and it was new for the Lake District. It's just, it's just, these, these silly things happen. And they only happen if you actually get out on miserable days in November. And here it is, a uh, very distinctive species you'd have thought, 12, 11, 12 millimeters long, uh, nice speckled uh, wing cases, a uh, yellowish um, pronosum with the black sort of semi-triangular smudge on it in the middle. It can fly, photograph here by Jeff Nobbs showing it in flying. And it must have got, this This was the only species I could find in, in school not to time, and that was new for the Lake District. Now this species um, is called the Super Tramp by the Germans. Uh, they, 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 they actually tracked it across the whole of its distribution, which is here. And they found that so you could work out from the DNA that it actually originated here in New Guinea 1.5 million years ago. It spread out, became the commonest water beetle in New Zealand. Um, all over many parts is the commonest species in Australia as well, uh, certainly around Japan, uh, most of Europe, right out into the, as I think they're exaggerating the Azores a bit there, it's out right out to the Azores, and presumably it fills in this gap as well, but uh, it hasn't got to the new world yet. But this is the most widely distributed water beetle in the world, and uh, they call it the super tramp because presumably they thought it was doing a good super tramp job. Anyway. So that's, I'm, I'm kind of giving you that one as an example of the extreme opposites of the others. One best specimen found in the Lake District in November 2017, new for the Lake District, and yet dirt common. Right, the, the, one thing, the other thing about this species is it's very, very similar to another species. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, oh dear, this is Stephen again. So Stephen, Stephen is still, Stephen is still appearing again. Um, and I don't know if some of you can recognise, not necessarily him, but where we are. This is junction 37 on the M6, and there's a, there's a, there's a little um, wind farm there. And again, you choose your days carefully. You go up on the most miserable day imaginable when you get water drops below the camera lens and so on. Fail day. And there in that pond, you get Rantus sutrevillus, which is a peat bog species, but it doesn't actually live in peat bogs. It lives in little ponds in peat bogs. And it's not to be confused with the super tramp sutrevillus. And this is one of its sites. Uh, it's uh, one of the scariest sites I've been to across the world. This is Spear Pots. It's a, a big doline um, just up from Sun Digging Tarn, if you know where that is, uh, on the way into Yorkshire from, from Cumbria. And uh, it's fenced off for a reason. It's one of the most dangerous places I've ever been into. Uh, absolutely lethal. Uh, where it's a, sink, it's a sinkhole, basically, where the, the ground is being dissolved by rainwater and then being filled in by peat because it's on, it's on limestone. And just despite the fact that it's on limestone, it's very acid, and the, that beetle is very common in there. But, for example, here's one um, the last, oh, this, this is one in, back in August. This is uh, one of these tiny shake holes that you see dotted all over the map in, uh, around Shap, places like that. Here's a little, little one, it's only about five, mil five meters across, little floating peat bog, and that, that is just as dangerous as, as the big one at um, Spear Pots. Um, you, you can't get into that, but it's the commonest beetle in there was uh, Vantus citrellus again. So the shake holes, very, very interesting. Nobody's actually done a, 
I, I, I really want to, if, if, I was, if I was younger again, I think I'd do a survey, shake hole by shake hole. I mean, there must be thousands of these across northern England. They're quite exciting places to work. Um, yeah, just put these up. Temple Sowerby, um, back in the oh, 70s, yeah, but there was an organisation called Nature Conservancy Council, if you remember it, and they were very keen on scheduling sites, and they created things called SSSI. I don't know what's happened to those, but anyway, the, um, we got one, we actually got bent their ear, and they, they put Temple Sowerby Moss on, onto the schedule. They, they designated it as an SSSI. Okay, there are some plants there as well. But we, we found, because we found this Lacornis longest in this pond by Temple Sowerby, and there's a friend of mine who only curses me on the basis that he actually lost money as a result of this, because uh, he expected to gain a significant amount of compensation from the bypass running through his garden. But because of this scheduling of Temple Sowerby Moss, the bypass went the other side of the town. Um, anyway, it's, the joke being, of course, that by the time they'd finished the bypass, the beetle had disappeared as well. The beetle had bypassed it as well. I can't find the beetle there anymore. But what you can you can find it further just down the road in, in Yorkshire at Lorkland Moss. So it hangs around in, in one isolated spot there, quite abundant. Um, there's its distribution. Now, the reason for showing you this one if you think about the other distributions I've shown in Sova, this is more or less a combination of all those maps, except, thank goodness, most of the dots are modern. They're all millennial. This species is hanging on like grim death in all of these isolated pockets, um, including Lorkland moss there, for example, probably not Temple Sowerby moss, common across uh, much of uh, Ireland, particularly what we call Cutover bog. They're, it's a very good thing to actually dig up peat bogs now and again. You get much better sites for water peats. Down in the border myers, um, around Selkirk, uh, in, in, the, in the Scottish borders, it's found in uh, the Speyside, and obviously you can see it does quite well in Norfolk still, and in Somerset levels and so on. But th this is a, an example of one of these species that's it. it. It doesn't know it yet, but it is in trouble, because if, it, if it's not kept, it's going to go the same way as the other species that have the, the same sort of distribution pattern. Um, here's another one. For you, uh, uh, this is one, a whirligig beetle, Gerinus nartata. Uh, the only guaranteed records of it in, in Britain, uh, in England, were in Cliburn Moss uh, and in Newton Rainey Moss in, in Cumberland, uh, Westland, and uh, right Cumberland actually, and uh, and yet it's still, as you can see from the map, still common in Ireland if you know where to look. Uh, which is mainly in shaded parts of uh, peat, of lakes and peat bogs. It sort of skulks, whereas the commonest species in Britain, Gerana substriatus, which is constantly muddled up with it, um, it occurs in, uh, openly, parade itself. You can see them at virtually any water body. Uh, but Gerana sinatata was obviously always very rare and has died out completely. There would be a temptation to introduce it back to reintroduce it from Ireland to the north of Britain. But judging from what happened in Scandinavia, it would appear that this species is very sensitive to competition. Wordigig seem to compete for space on the surface of the water. And it, it'd probably be a waste of time. It, it probably wouldn't do very, very, very well. Uh, it, it, we can see why it disappeared from Cliburn Moss, by the way, that this thing got its throat cut. And there's just one, one great big cut through the middle of the bog, drained it. This, this one, the Unirane Moss, got overgrown. So that one had, had it as well. Very tempting to think about introducing it, but I don't think it would work. Now, um, lesser, lesser silver water beetle, the, the, one of our biggest uh, hydrophilic beetles, uh, 14, 15 millimetres long. Um, here's a drone's eye view of a pond in, uh, of the, in the Chester Zoo Park. Uh, it was found in Cheshire from 1990 onwards. It seems to choose very good sites which suggests that it may have been there all along and nobody noticed. But it's difficult to overlook a beetle this size. Um, and at one stage it was in Britain, it was confined to the Somerset levels. But now, as you can see, it's doing very well in the Cheshire Plain. Uh, record last year in, in Shropshire, new, new record at the bottom end there. And, but you can see all the other records where it's died out in other parts of Britain. And it used to be um, a, one of the commoner species in, around London in the 19th century. Uh, Anyway, there's another case where perhaps introductions might be quite interesting. Very easy species to monitor because you can easily see where it's, its egg cocoons floating on the surface if you choose to have some of the year. Right. 
Now we're getting re- really weird now. This is this is a beef. When I was at a meeting in Manchester a few years ago, Jim Thomas came up to me and said, I've got this funny detiscus. That it's, it's, it's obviously something wrong with it. It's, sort of gro- it's, it's obviously growing wrongly. It's, 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 it's sort of some sort of growth defect. Uh, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't detiscus at all. It was sebista. This is 35 millimetres long, bigger than most of your uh, diving beetles. Um, one specimen found in this. Um, now, some people think this is a wonderful nature reserve. I think it's one of the most ghastly places on Earth. I mean, you've got, it's, it's covered in boardwalk. See, the water is absolutely filthy. It's nothing but reed canary grass. But birds and bird watchers seem to love it. I won't, won't name this site. Anyway, that's where this was found on a path in 8th of September 2005. We went, we dutifully went back when we, when we realised Jim's mistake in not seeing it as something special, and of course we couldn't find it. Um, there's its distribution map. Now, if you want the op- the extreme case of what we're talking about, this was found in the 1830s uh, in Essex, and then you've got this one one specimen there. Uh, carefully speared there with a pin, which was the last specimen known in Britain. In fact, it, across Europe as a whole, uh, this Sibista is expanding its range no end. It's, move, it's moving north in, in Russia, for example. So it's, it's amazing in some ways. It's not, and it also is a very strong flyer. So it's amazing it's not actually turned up in Britain yet, apart from this one specimen in this um, unnamed RSVB nature reserve. What have we learned so far? So, first of all, the, the richer of the plant life, the better the beetles. So why bother to work with beetles? Well, uh, some beetles don't like, don't need plants. They live in habitats in water without plants. Um, some of them like places that dry out, so they don't have any um, sort of classic w- 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 water plants anyway. Um, you need a net, GB net sold but now, nowadays by NHBS, uh, or you need with a one millimeter mesh, or you get a kitchen sieve if you're a Dutchman. And I know there are some Dutch people listening to this or watching this. They use sieves all the time. They use them just as effectively as we use nets. And also, if you're my wife, who's in the other room trying to stop people phoning us, because we guarantee everybody, phone, as soon as you do one of these things, everybody starts telephoning, um, you get uh, you have a tea strainer, and that works just as well in some cases. But most of all, I should emphasize, you need a big white tray. I should have taken a photograph of one of those to sort out on these very dull days we're going out. Another thing we may have learned is that Northwest England supports many species on the edge of their extinction, uh, on the edge of extinction in much of England. In fact, they've had it in most of England. It looks as if most of England has had it, full stop. But Northwest England is still supplying, might even yet supply species. It's lost at least one of them, the, the whirly gig species, um, but it can act as a donor site for re- reintroduction of the, some of these rare beetles into other parts of Britain. Um, and we have, with water beetles, the extraordinary extremes of relic species hanging on and modernity, species which are doing crazy things like coming from New Zealand, New Papua New Guinea via Japan. Um, you can move, I didn't mention the motorway, I, I said you can move bypasses. Well, in fact, you can also move motorways. If you go up the uh, M74 from northwest England into Glasgow, you will. there's a slight kink in the road where we actually got a site for the Cornus of Longus protected, and it's still there. And you can brighten up a very miserable day with the beetles, because most of the days we go out tend to be miserable. Um, and this is an advertisement. No, you usually end up with the... What do you usually end up with? The National Anthem, don't you? But here's, here's the advertisement. Um, they produced three atlases so far uh, of the the diving beetles and squeak beetle here on the left, and then the hydrophilid beetles, and then more recently uh, there's this this uh, strange animal here. This is this is dry ops, or the joke is, of course, we could call it wet ops. And it's uh, you see, whereas this one has got an air bubble which just is sticking out of its rear end because it's most of its air bubble is underneath its wing cases. In the case of the, the hydrophilids, they have a, an air bubble extending from their head under, under the entirety of the underside of their abdomen, and also including their wing cases. So, that, so they've got a, a big silvery air bubble covering their bottom. In this case, it goes even further, right the way down to the ends of the legs. But you see how it's, it's kept the tarsi uh, free of this air bubble gadget, 
uh, because it's got to hang on. It's a bit like a cork in water. It'll bob up if it lets go. So that they spend most of the time hanging on to stop themselves being forced up to the surface. Uh, that's, that's a dry up for you. Anyway, these are all dirt sheep. You still get them. Um, I think I've nearly finished. Apart from the fact, uh, I thought I ought to mention dung. As a re if, you want, if you thought that was weird, try this. Here's a water beetle lives in either um, cow dung. Which is, I mean, it's, it's just likened to swim again dung, um, or in sheep dung, it's a bit harder. This is Viridium substriatum, a photograph by, taken by one of the uh, guests in, in this, this uh, webinar, Arno. And Arno found that he found, uh, when he was going through the museum collections in, in Edinburgh, many years back now, he found in the chapel collection two specimens of Slavidium substriatum. And I don't, I don't think he realized at the time that they actually that was unknown in, in, the, in Britain. Uh, anyway, the chapel, the, the collection was, was uh, made by a man called Joseph Chapel uh, in, the in the 19th century. He, he worked in Sir Joseph Whitworth's factories in Manchester. Uh, the biography says that he was energetic and genial, uh, but he lost a leg. Uh, and, but still carried on collecting beagles. Now that's that's my kind of coleopterist. I think that's good, doing a good job there. But wh where he actually found these two beagles remains to be seen. Um, it's difficult to believe that he would have corresponded much with people in Central Europe, where this species occurs mainly. But you never know. It may, it may be that they're just the exchange specimens. But otherwise, somewhere in the in the in the bowels of Manchester, there are some. Um, well, it's all the outer of the bowels, kind of think of it. It is some dung which might contain Slavium substratum. The most recent, the only fact record which is relevant to this in the British Isles and beyond is one specimen found in Jersey in 1984. 1984. Um, so that's my case. There, there's, there's the weirdest one of the lot. Thank you. So if I, as far as I can see, the first question is from Kath saying, do all water beetles fly? No. So, some are very good at it. Some are, are very bad at it. There's every shade in between. It's, it's like I said. It's you know the the, the, the extremes from relicness to modernity. They, they they you've got every every conceivable idea. Some some are completely flightless. Some are the best flyers. Uh, if you create a new pond uh, in the summer, the first thing to reviving it is usually a beetle. I fly. Okay. Question from Alex. Are there any accessible keys for water beetles? <laughs> uh, uh, that's, a, that's a sort of leading question, isn't it? I mean, what do you mean, if you mean by accessible, or if you mean that you can get, easily get them, well, actually, when you've got them, they're any use. <laughs> two different things. <laughs> <laughs> are, they, are, they rub, are, they, are they rubbish keys that are really easily available? <laughs> yes, I, I don't, I, I hate keys. I, 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 back in the 19, uh, 1960s, we, we got, hang on, 1980s, sorry, we got, uh, Robert Angus and I decided that both of us couldn't possibly produce keys because we knew what these species were intuitively. Yeah, you know, we'd seen them for so many years that we, we, we didn't know why we knew what they were. So we got Laurie Friday to, to produce the, um, uh, the Field, Field Studies Council keys um, in those days, the AGAP key. Uh, and I think that, that still applies. I still think I'm useless at keys. Uh, I, I just know what something is. So, you know, you can get the jizz and that's it. Um, but I, 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 what I do, do know is you've got to dissect, and uh, an awful lot of people think they can do it from photographs. And, okay, eight times out of ten, they probably can, but the other two times will, will, give, will build up a very bad reputation for you if you're not careful. Next question is from Pigeon. Um, do water beetles hibernate? Yes, but some of them don't hibernate. They just carry on business as usual. Uh, long, long as the water, long as the water temperature is up to about, about five degrees centigrade, some are perfectly capable of, of continuing right the way through the winter. Which is why I'm saying it's very unusually compared to most entomologists. We can keep going as long as the weather's not too bad. Uh, but there are there are some groups like rant, rant, some genera which do genuinely come on to dry land to overwinter. But most of them though go into the mud in the water. Or just keep going. I've got a, a supplementary question for you, Gov. Um, is there any plan to reintroduce Hydrocara caraboides 
into some of the old sites in places like Bedfordshire where it used to occur? No, not, not, no, there isn't. It would uh, be, be fairly easy to do if you had the time and the, uh, you know, you can you could collect egg cocoons, for example, at the right time of year without damaging the, a, a local donor population not too much. You wouldn't have to get in with your net. You could take a few yeah. egg cocoons away. You could do it, yes, and, and that, that yeah. might work. I mean, I, 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 I think I'm, 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 I, when I did my reintroductions of, of um, hydroponics, I, I, I learned quite a lot. Of, I learned enough about introductions to know that I didn't like them. Um, I, uh, and one of the reasons was that I, I transmitted with the beetle um, its own trematode. Right. And I thought, yeah. I mean, you know, unless you unless you really know a lot more about the biology of the beast than we know now. Um, I don't think you can justify any any taking any risks of that kind. So, so that that's the, but I'm I'm probably out on a limb there, just to get yeah. it. But yeah, I'm, I I think you wait long enough. I mean, harder cars to say it's, 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 it's turned up this year in in Shropshire. I mean, I, I'm not to say not who's to say it wasn't there all the time. We didn't notice it. But you know, given it time, I know it flies wonderfully. It, it, it's very active, uh, yeah. and uh, it, give it a chance, it might do it. Yeah, we're we're studying them in um, Shapwick on the yeah. Somerset Hills at the minute, yeah. and finding out quite a few things about them. We have now found winter records, um, one in a wood chip pile, and another yeah. of an adult in in a ditch in oh yeah, yeah. Um, which I think were the first winter records. Well, we're going yes. to try and look at some of the larval forms now. The, the, um, the, the weird thing was originally when we when we compared the date, the basic crude record records for Cheshire and Somerset levels, they were quite different in phenology between the two areas. You know, there's a significant distance, difference in the timings, but uh, who, whether that whether that was just sort of north south or whether it's two different populations, so, you know, it's different races of the same thing. Who knows? Yeah. But I, I, I personally would give it time. I, I think it, I think it's going to. It's, it's obviously still doing quite well in Cheshire, although we don't get as many records now as we used to. But it's, it's certainly spread out. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the other one that's of course is on the increase is Hydrophilus piscius. That, that, yeah. that's, that's, that's filling in in, yeah. in, in, in across across the uh, coast of East Anglia. So I'm getting records virtually every week in light traps. So yeah, yeah we're, we're finding it all over the place now. Yeah. But it's still, it's still not got back into places like Wiccan Fen. You know, if, if, at least I haven't found it yet. I'm sure, I'm sure it's got to be there. I mean, I, I found it in West Norfolk for the first time a couple of years ago. Um, but but uh, they, 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 it was where they were digging the um, uh, pits for the oh for the for the fog. That's it. Yeah, they, that that was that was really good because it, it was in it was in the fog pits, which we're not supposed to talk about. No. Do you use bottle traps at all? Uh, I don't think I'd use them there. I think I might get shot by the by the reptile people. Um, no, I'll um, <laughs> yes, I use bottle traps a lot, uh, yeah. uh, but one has to be so careful with them, with bottle traps. Not because of the sensitivities of, of amphibia people, but because that if you if you if you lose them, um, they can wipe out a population you know, uh, in certain situations. Uh, so yes, I use bottle traps. Okay, well, Thank you. we'll. Thank you. We'll go to uh, another question from the floor then to Keith. So I think you've unmuted yourself already, Keith. I have unmuted um, myself, yes. Yeah, it's, um, I'm fascinated by um, this, um, I have three copies of Sopraditans figuratus. Oh. Garth very kindly um, identified three yeah. them for me and sent them back. Yeah, I see. And, yeah. uh, D uh, D Andrew Duff says that they occur mainly in central and eastern England. So um, yes. it's it, 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 climate change. Yeah, you're talking about Dorsalis versus Figurators. Yeah. I yeah. Got, yeah. 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 Well, well, they. 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 I mean, the, the weird thing is, I mean, they occur together. They like the same habitats. So it's, it's a place that's good for one of these species. Well, so the other one will occur as well. Uh, and and, it, and you re it's really hard work to be certain you've got the right species, yeah. But the yeah. DNA is everything. The DNA tells you that there are two two species there uh, doing different things, but they, according to us, they're not. 
So what's the status on, on the DNA now? Is it, um, are they going back to being um, hydroporous now? Uh, yes, I, I, I was expecting Robert Angus, who was the one who originally set up the idea of suffragites as a separate genus, I was, I was expecting him to sort of bridle at this and, and try to reinstate it. I think I think the DNA suggests that they are what you might call nested. They're, they're, they're within hydroporous. You can't you can't actually remove them again, which is a shame because they are very distinct as, as, as animals. I mean, they, some of the, they, some of these don't look like hydroporous at all. But Ray, I mean, I, I was looking at this. I, I've been actually doing some this week. I've been backtracking in the spirit collection, as one isn't allowed to do anything else here now. Um, and uh, they really are very, very difficult to deal deal with, especially, especially when they, when you get the black form. You know, both both species have a, have um, if you, if they were the, if they're the extremes of their color forms, they are distinct. But when they when you get the darker forms, they're obviously they're almost exactly the same, and and you can measure them. The, the, the EDA because is difficult, so the, the claws are difficult, um, but the DNA is perfect. What do you do? But then I can show you uh, four species of Agabus guttasis that all have totally different DNA, but we draw a veil over that and say they're all one species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can I ask just uh, another one? Um, what about um, the Anacana and um, Heracarius uh, genesis. Which, which which group are you talking about? The Lutescens versus Limbata, or are you something else? Yeah. Um, well, you you happen. I think you've actually got listening to you on this. You've got Arno van Berger Henoga, and he was he was actually on the list of people here a few moments ago. So uh, he's the expert. He start he started this rot in 1986 by publishing the difference between the two species. So there you are. You don't need to talk to me. Mm. <laughs> and um, we've got um, bipistulata, it seems. Um, oh, yes. Oh, so that one. No, that, that's, that's that's much more distinct, bipistulata, yeah. yeah. Whereabouts are you talking? Where, whereabouts do you mean? Where? Um, so a water park um, on the border of, of Manchester. Oh, yeah, I've got it there now, have you? OK. Yeah. It okay. seems to be, yes. Okay. Although, um, again, does cause it very local indeed. Yeah. Well, I had the book a minute ago, but I don't know where it's going. So that's the whole point of the thing there. What am I doing over there? The Limbata there too. Uh, so I'm, I'm desperately looking at the atlas to see how far north it can go. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Let's talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, I was trying to, trying to remember how far north I've seen Anacena bypass uh, mm. and I mean, you, you obviously know more than I do at the moment. No, you know? no, I, was, um, I, I probably misidentified them. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, well, send them to me. I mean, you know, it's, it's what I'm there for. Well, I mean, that, that's, I don't know if you can actually see this. I mean, that, that's the map. I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 there's not many maps that are quite as distinct as that for, in terms of distributions. That, that, that's... Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't know if it's up there, they really can. Yeah, it's, it's just leave that big black bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear enough that it's it, Manchester would be, be quite a long shot now. I don't, it's not a species that I know as being on the move. You know, we, we get oh, records yeah. of other species. You know, we, we, we can't possibly do what butterfly collectors do and watch things go in year in, year out, that sort of thing. We, we, we only can pick up uh, vague ideas of how things are moving, but I don't, I've never thought of bypass data as being a species <laughs> on the, uh, expanding its range. Um, but yeah, well, why, why not? Manchester's okay. Yeah, uh, there's an open, open sites there. It won't, won't be in dense vegetation or anything like that. You know, no weedy it, ponds. No, not, not, I think that's on the edge of its distribution. I don't know. Uh, but uh, the, I mean, within Anacena itself, uh, as uh, hopefully Arno, if Arno's still there, he will um, tell you. I mean, there, there are problems probably with uh, Limbata and. Lutescens um, covering a multitude of sins, so there may be DNA might pick up more species there. I think I think mm -hmm. bipastulata is safe enough. Okay, thanks very much. If you, I mean, if you want if you want Anacena, Anacena globulus. Um, we we can find that there are subpopulations of even the commonest beetle in Britain. There are, are subpopulations of this species picking up can, can picked up as well. It's too too scary. And of course, you know we've got this. There's a parthenogenetic 
form of Anasena lutescens that gets a lot further north than the the, the ones uh, the, the bisexual species. You know that. So in, in Scotland we only have. I can always I can always impress people easily if they're that stupid. But I'm just saying. So oh, look, there, there's an Anasena lutescens and it's female because we know it can't be anything else uh, because they've got a chromosome aberration. Oh, that was Arno, Arno there. He says. He said Arno says. Agree by oh, his, 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 his message has gone. Yeah. Well, why, did it, why did it go off? I think it's just he, he hasn't got a microphone. I hasn't got a microphone. That's his problem with his computer. Uh, that's that's still the okay. Where are we? Oh, there we are. Look, globulus. Uh, the globulus is he said, uh, yes, he said that by, bypass last was okay. I'm not quite sure what that means, I know, but um, globulus is likely not likely to fly often where it doesn't fly. Theoretically, at all in 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 Britain, well, it certainly flies abroad. It's, it's, it, uh, our form our form in Britain is, uh, is is lacking any flight muscle at all. <coughs> so as soon as you go to France, you can pick up specimens that have got flight muscles and a slightly different shape. The globulus is very abundant here in uh, yeah flooded long grass. Yes, it's, yeah, I mean yes, it's. it's uh, well, I think it just thinks the whole of Britain as being a very wet place, irrespective of whether there's any puddles there or not. So yes, it's everywhere. Yes, it's ubiquitous. Yes, it does. It doesn't need to fly because it's everywhere. Uh, which is a, there's some logic in that, I suppose. Yeah. I've always thought. I don't know if Arno's still listening. I've always thought that there's got to be another species hiding in Limbata when you get into the south of Britain. You get this very small form that, the, for which there are names available, which always looks as if it ought to be only, it ought to be a separate species. Um, but I mean, as you, I mean, the, the other nightmare, as you probably will know, is that um, you know, what we've thought of as one species, Hydrobius fuscipes, is in fact at least three species, possibly anything up to seven species, um, based on DNA. Um, that is all awesome. In some ways, I'm quite glad I'm very old. But I don't have to worry about it. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the next question now. Um, so another question from Mag's cousins um, for, for Garth. At Under Millbeck Common, yeah. were there the same 34 to 36 species <laughs> between 2011 and 2014? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, 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 I'll just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 there, there, were no, there were no big changes. I mean, there were, there's always losses and gains every year that you... Some species do well, some species do not so well, and so on. But no, no, they're, 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 it's more or less the same species from one year to the next. The, the overall list, so there were three ponds there at least. So, you know, you, 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 going back to your idea about with, with your baggers, you know, with lots of ponds in different stages of development, uh, there, there's always something suitable for each species. Yeah. So the answer is yes, within reason. Okay, a question from Glenn Norris. As coastal flooding increases along south coast tidal rivers, are there any water beetles that could indicate increases in salinity, either by their presence or absence? Yeah, well, one of the, one of the, uh, yeah I mean, we're obviously trying the best with very limited amount of information to monitor whether species are responding to climate change. And you'd, you'd have thought that most of our um, brackish water species love very warm conditions provided by the Atlantic, the Gulf Stream, you know, on the, on the very edge of the, of the coast. So they, they don't have to worry about very severe winters because they're getting the benefits of, of, of um, winter warming. Uh, you'd have thought they would be the species that would do quite well moving further north, and they're not. Um, I mean, there are still species, um, which are quite common in most of Europe, which are still absent from the, from the Solway. Uh, uh, so, so it's frustrating. The, 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 within, within that group, there aren't, there aren't as many as you might think. No. The, the, the classic one I've got, but I mean, you know, we don't have enough people recording things on year on the year out. I mean, when we, we got to the two year, last year, yes, last year, we got we got to a remote uh, uh, island on the edge of the Orkneys, Stronze, and we got uh, Octavius marinus there. Now that is crazy because it was common, and it was. Um, well, a significant distance further north of its sites in um, the south of Scotland. 
Uh, but, but of course, we don't, we don't know. We, we're the first people to go to Strong's, right? a bit like landing on the moon. Um, similarly, the, the pub was shut as well. But they, they, so it's a terrible place. Uh, but I mean, you know, who, who's to say whether that species has been there for all time? I think, I think when, I, when I suggested in, in, in one of these atlases that it might be an uh, expansion of range, uh, somebody pointed out to me that there are fossil uh, sub-fossil deposits, uh, with, with including it, uh, quite far north as well, which I hadn't known about. Now, the the sub-fossil record is very, very scattered, but it's very interesting. It's very informative. Okay. Is it sometimes a good idea to collect water beetles using light traps? I made good experience with hydrophilidae. Yeah. Um, well, the, the trouble is, Nicola, you, you get the same species over and over again. You know, you, you don't get a complete range of species, but you do get interesting records, definitely. Uh, so it's much better than collecting moths, tell him. Yes. In fact, I come to think of it, anything is better than collecting moths. I would agree. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, look, a giant detiscus has just appeared. It's a latissimus. Hey. Where'd that come from? Oh, that's an, oh, hello. Oh, I, I, I know you. Okay, yeah. I, uh, Nicola, I've been a bit long. Okay, yes. Well, that, 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 that sounded more Dutch. Yes, it's a good likeness. Bill um, Alwyn has apparently raised his hand. And it, I don't know if you're seeing this stuff. Oh, okay. We'll, 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 go, to, we'll go to Bill then. Um, yeah, just on that, um, catching beetles with light traps, mm -hmm. we found by accident we were out um, doing some cutting down of birch trees and it was a fairly damp sort of day so we'd spread a large plastic black tarpaulin out to mm. sit on and we were rained on by small hydroporus and various other small um, aquatic beetles that thought we were a pond so yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's uh, worth trying that, I think, with a large, black, shiny tarpaulin. If the weather conditions are right and things are flying about, you'll get them. You get the right, get the right sort of polarised light. The experts on, on light uh, attracting beetles are the Hungarians, and Zoltan Sabai and Co. And they've, they've looked at the effects of these huge light farms, you know, the, the, the photovoltaic cell farms. And of course, it only affects certain beetles which fly during the day. I mean, an awful lot of beetles fly at dusk, just for maybe an hour the most. And there are even some that fly at night. But most, mostly, uh, so you, you, you'll still only get a limited range of species that way. But you're, what, what you've probably got is on your black plastic sheet is, is thousands of Olophus brevipalpis and Olophus equalis. Um, if you're lucky, you might get one or two others, but that's it. That, that's the trouble with it. You don't get a complete range of species. But then we don't get a complete range of species just by netting either. So uh, all, all, all things are helpful. Okay, we'll go to a question um, back to the, the chat box now. So a question from Craig McAdam. Are you seeing changes in distribution as a result of climate warming? Yes. And um, you're talking about ones, what, what, what I see being me is it, I, I see nothing I see I see st stasis I think I see well one one species in ten you, you will be moving quite well and the others will be doing absolutely nothing uh, you know so it's it's it's, it's, it's if you almost flick a switch for some species and not for others and then, and then they go into motion and we've seen this particular I know what the reason Craig's asking is because you know, we, we, I, I, was, I was constantly looking along the south coast of Scotland for species coming into Scotland now. I tend to be, if, if I could, if I could get out, if I could escape from tier level tier four, oh. tier four, I'd be looking uh, more into Stirlingshire and, and, and the Perthshire, because that, that's where all the, the, the new speaking things have got that far. They've moved further north. So yes, is the answer. But if you try to do it with, with, without having a theory to back you up, you will actually find evidence of some species moving, north, moving south. Not that many, but there are some species that are moving in the wrong direction. Okay, um, a question from Keith. What is the DNA status of Sophrodites now? 
it's just uh, well, he's we, done that one. I mean, basically, oh, yes. So oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. So, so, well, I mean, but the basic is the DNA is very good, but the morphology is very bad. <laughs> so, so yes, we know there are two species, but sometimes it's very, very difficult to differentiate them. And, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, Mm. That's right. Sorry, okay. we're, we're st we're st with, with the I'm, questions, I'm, we're still I'm, backed up by about I'm, half an hour. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't worry, go. I mean, there are actually two levels of question there. One question is, is Saphrodites the genus valid uh, in, with it, as opposed to Hydroporus? And then while you're at it, are the two species in it valid as well? And there are two different species. And the answer is that uh, Saphrodites as a genus is not valid, uh, but the, hydro the two species within that particular group are valid. DNA, DNA proves that. Yeah, uh, that, that's nailed it, hasn't it? I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that'll do me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But we right. we'd like, we we very, very much like to go back to Sophrodites as a separate um, genus because apart from anything else, its larvae are very distinctive as well. We've seen them. They're yeah. more, they're more like Nevipolis, but yeah. Anyway. Yes. But it's certainly separate in in Andrew Duff. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Okay, we're, we're, we're not really catching up here because I'm still 25 minutes behind on the questions in the messages. To, uh, so oh, we're okay. not really gaining because they're end, adding on to the end here. But um, So a question from Kath again. Are water beetles predatory? Uh, the, the, the answer is, is generally yes. The, if you're, uh, the, 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 the diving beetles are all predators. I can't forget any which are go out of the way to eat plant material. Um, but they, the adults tend to be more scavengers of, of fallen prey or damaged or, or, or rotting in, insects. Uh, that's why you get them so effectively in, in traps. Uh, the larvae tend to be um, a, 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 that, the much more effective as, as catching living animals and killing them. Um, it, with uh, the hydrophilidae, the adults are for the most part plant feeders, but the, the larvae are almost exclusively predators, and they're ambush predators. They live just on the water's edge, and they, 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 the trouble with them is that they're, um, they, they, they can't uh, digest things under the water. They have to pull them out of the water in order to use the enzymes, uh, and, and so they, they tend to be amph uh, sort of amphibious larvae as predators. Even, even within them, there's exceptions. There are some species, that even are pests of, of winter wheat. So that, that's a, a very, very small story. So the answer is basically yes. Okay, a question from Genevieve. What's the highest altitude water beetle in the UK? <laughs> Has she just been to uh, on a bicycle route around the Coolins or something? No, it wasn't a Coolins. Where, where, where was she? Is this, is, this, is this Genevieve who used to be Genevieve Daly? That's the one. I think so. Got married. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume it was. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Um, you, you probably just caught it if you've been up in that, that area. Um, Fingers crossed. I, 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 the, the highest I know is, if you want to know, is one that uh, Pelham, uh, Pelham Clinton, the Duke of Newcastle, caught on Brerach. Is that how you pronounce it? Brerach, uh, on in the Cairngorms. He got an agabus at the top of the Cairngorms there, which is... What what height's that, Kevin? I'll put you on that. You tell me what that is. Right, bro, Is it three nine? Something, something crazy. Anyway, he, he found a beetle there, and he always used to think he, he, he refused to believe it was anything other than dear old Agabus bipatulatus, and all it was was Agabus bipatulatus. He was. Well, he did catch it the other day, then, Garth. That. Yeah, you might you may well have caught it if you've been where you've been. Yeah, I don't know. What, what, what height was your beetle at? Only about what? 700. 700? No, nah, no, no, nothing. No, no. Anyway, I think, I, think, I think the top of the Cairngorms is probably better. I don't think there's anything at the top of Ben Nevis, uh, so that wouldn't work. Uh, it has to be, has to be the Cairngorms, yeah. I, I, I've always had a rule in life. My son has started to do Munro's. And I've had a, whenever I climb a mountain, I refuse point blank to go to the triangulation point. I, I prefer to stay just below the the, bottom, the, the top, uh, and then and look, look for shallow ground, uh, you know, ground which might be flooded. So I'll, I'll collect in a lake at the top of a mountain, but I won't go to the top of the mountain. So it's a good habit to have, unless you get to my shape. Now you can't get up anything. I can't get on a bus. 
Okay, uh, we'll go to the next question then. Um, <laughs> so, a question from Linda. Um, can you core the lake bed to take samples of the past fauna? Yes, as long as it's been not too mucked up about too much. I mean, sometimes people have discovered that um, it's been badly damaged by you know by human activity or, or even by by some some of the fish. But uh, yes, you can. Um, but uh, there, there you're in the realms of kiranomid head capsules, aren't you? Everybody does fly larvae, and that's much more effective, I'm afraid. People, we have tried in the past, when, when this hydroscape project started in uh, 2017, um, the, the idea was to actually go around doing just that and uh, take, take mud samples from, from the bottoms of Glaswegian lakes and things like that. And it, it, it didn't come to anything. You, you get a very limited range of material. Uh, most, uh, foss, most beetle deposits are uh, in, uh, in, in peat and, and in, in uh, sort of great, um, lenses of organic material in, 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 in dry, dry areas, not, not in lake bottoms. Not that many species live in big lakes. Hmm? They wouldn't tell you that much. Okay, I think this is possibly the last question on the list now. Yeah. Um, so, another question from Keith. Are the dancing swarms of, for example, Helithorus mm. for mating purposes? Uh, no, don't think so. Um, that's, that's a good question, Keith. No, they're not like flies, thank God. No, they, um, they, uh, no, it, no it isn't. I think they're just, they're just using the warmth to keep going, no, I'd have to, no, no, they, they don't, they don't mate out of the water anyway, so no. Hopefully you'd find that most of those species that are actually doing that swarm are um, already fertilised. I'm, 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 I'm thinking, right now, I'm thinking about a swarm I once saw in, in, Sard, in Sardinia um, of Inocris, which, which, which I thought there were so many of them. I thought at one stage they must be flies, and they weren't. They're actually beetles. But no, they they, they don't. They don't. They don't, it's not. It's not a mating thing. I'll tell you what does though. Um, the the contosiphons, the very small skirted beetles. Uh, when you if you get in sweeping them, uh, and you keep detailed uh, notes and what's what's where, you'll find that there are male swarms and there are almost female swarms as well, as if uh, they they line up and then they 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 then go move across. For mating purposes, so you, you can get uh, swarms of females and males moving into them and being intercepted. And so, yeah, I tell you, and, and, they, and they mate, of course, above the ground because they, they, the adults live above the water anyway. And um, as I'm sure you, some of you know, that when a, when a, when a, uh, a contosiphon is, is mating, the females drag the male around one of them as a sort of trophy for some time afterwards. Um, so, oh, Arno's written, are these not swarming aphodias? <laughs> I know, no, I, no, I think you, no, the halophas do swarm, uh, especially when they're, they're over the surface, but something like, as you say, a black plastic sheet, or the other common thing is a red car. They love the red cars. So, <laughs> so, so, so yes, yeah, well, yeah. we, we were picnicking outside and we got totally sort of browned off by uh, um, brevet palpes. Um, yeah. Uh, hundreds of them. Yeah. Just throw me. Oh yeah. I think I think they're just tuned tuned into the 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 light and the heat, the combination of light and heat being reflected off the off the material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, th they think it's the most wonderful pond imaginable. I don't think they they found that they don't. I don't think they found. I don't think they found the, the most wonderful mate imaginable. I think they just think they found the most most ni nicest pond. Uh, I know it's being silly, but I know I, I I don't. There aren't any mating dances in in the office. But there are definitely mating clusters in in, uh, in skirted flies, in skirted flies, in skirted. Be it's time to go to the pub. Skirted beetles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Get in there. laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, well, I think we we've, we've got to the bottom of the questions. I mean, Garth doesn't have to go to his pub meeting for another hour, so. <laughs> well, I might, I might get tuned up. <laughs> um. You carry on as long as you wish, but I mean, there's no, there's no point in dragging it out. But I mean, if you want, if you want other things to do, do it. Yeah, yeah. We could do the whole talk again if you like. <laughs>
Um, well, um, unless unless anyone else has any other burning questions in the next thirty seconds, then uh, we'll we'll leave it there. <laughs>